degrees right now. So many of us, including myself, very, very happy. Temperatures are going up. However, some doctors who were dealing with Lyme disease and p patients who were chronically ill with that disease really get busy this time of the year. Once the temperatures go up, this is when the ticks come out, and uh, we need to be armed. We need to know what to look for right now. Yeah, Lyme disease is uh, very, very serious, and sometimes it's underestimated, I believe, uh, by some physicians. Let's bring in Dr. Stephen Phillips. He is a world-renowned Lyme specialist, and he's here to uh, help us out as we get ready for uh, tick season. Good morning, sir. Good morning. All right, so what are the symptoms? Uh, there can be no symptoms. And you can have symptoms ranging to acutely life-threatening, you know, heart failure and everything in between. In my office, when patients come in, we go down the list of symptoms. I ask about headaches, stiff neck, sensitivity to light and sound, uh, cognitive problems, meaning memory, concentration, sometimes mood disturbances, nuances of psychiatric problems. In terms of uh, musculoskeletal symptoms, it could be muscle pain at rest, muscle pain with motion. So it could be joint anything. Pain. And it can be well, misdiagnosed, right? I mean, some people it can, think it's fibromyalgia. You know, one of the nicknames for Lyme is the next great imitator because it can imitate so many other illnesses. Wow. So it can affect any part of the body. There's not a cell in the body that Lyme can't infect. And because of that, it's a, a kind of a, a source of controversy in the medical community because it's hard to reconcile. How can you have a situation where people get infected and not get sick or not get sick for many years and then get sick decades later? And that's what happened to my dad. So he had a, a, what they thought was a viral meningitis and then kind of minor heart palpitations which progressed over literally a couple of decades until the point where he almost needed a heart transplant. Wow. And he didn't have typical Lyme disease. And it just takes one tick bite. Going out into the woods, one tick can, can do this. So ticks are cesspools and what we think of as Lyme disease is not just one infection. So technically Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia burgdorferi which is one type of bacteria. But they carry so many different microbes. There's other strains of Borrelia. There's about 300 different strains of the bacteria that cause Lyme. And they vary tremendously on how they cause disease. And then there are cousins to Lyme disease that aren't really Lyme, but are uh, very close cousins. And they'll never test positive for Lyme, but they essentially do the same thing. By the way, I mean, you don't necessarily have to see a bullseye to have Lyme disease, not. right? Because no. these ticks kind of hide in private spots in your body? So the ticks are very tiny. The nymphal tick for Lyme is about the size of a poppy seed. And they crawl up in your nooks and crannies. And in your body? Yeah. And they, they generally like to find a protected spot, you know, um, in the armpits, in the groin, in these areas that you don't think to check for something that's so, so tiny. And they'll just hang out there in this very safe, protected area. Then they'll drop off. You won't even know you have a bite. Sometimes people get a rash, and sometimes they won't. And the rash doesn't have to last all that long when it occurs. All right, Rosanna and I don't have Lyme disease. We don't want to get it. Uh, what can we do to uh, prevent that from happening? Because we, we, we like the outdoors. Right. So there's primary prevention and the secondary prevention. And primary prevention would be, you know, avoiding tick-infested environments. Which and, is impossible because if you go right. out to Long Island or you go out to right. Connecticut. And I heard it's also, is it in Central Park as well? I mean, it, I, I don't have the statistics on Central Park. I know some of the parks in New York City, there's a park in the Bronx where they had uh, found ticks that were infected with Lyme. But, you know, the birds carry these ticks and they can go all over. So there's no reason that ticks wouldn't be infected in Central Park. So let's assume that we are in tick country. But let me what just do focus away from the ticks for a second okay. because, you know, it's not just uh, a ticks that you have to be worried about. You know, when people think of Lyme disease, the studies are showing now that two thirds of chronic Lyme uh, patients are actually co-infected with another bacteria called Bartonella. And Bartonella is basically ignored by the medical community. Everybody fights about Lyme. It's a very polarizing illness. Nobody fights about Bartonellosis. No one's heard of Bartonellosis. I don't even know what it, that is. Exactly. And uh, so it's another bacteria. It's spread by the same tick that spreads Lyme disease. It's also spread by bugs that don't or typically are thought to spread Lyme disease, like fleas and, and lice, and even there's case reports of spiders and ants spreading Bartonella. All right, Doc, I'm on, officially on high alert here. What <laughs> do we need to do when we go outside? I would say that you have to be your own best health advocate. Obviously, the primary prevention stuff people talk about all the time, it's all of the news about tick checks, which is important, and using permethrin, which is an insecticide that you can spray in your clothing, but you can't spray in your skin. I went over that last time I was here. But the real issue is what happens when you start getting symptoms, you go to the doctor, 
and they do a simple Lyme ELISA, which is a screening test for Lyme, and it's negative, and they say, well, it can't be Lyme. I want everyone to know that if you wake up and it's a beautiful, bright, sunshiny spring day, and you open your window and it's a perfect, you hear the birds chirping, and everything is wonderful, on that perfect day, that the Lyme test will still be an unmitigated failure. And they're insensitive uh, uh, in the simplest of terms. And in a very small percentage of patients that have Lyme arthritis, they're extremely sensitive. So, you know, they're defining sensitivity of these tests based on a stereotype. And unfortunately, they're stereotyping a very broad array of illness from a very small stereotype of the population. Doc, well, where can we find you? We know you're a specialist, and we know that you have your hands full already with a yes, lot of patients. Yes, and I appreciate this question last time. I'm in Wilton, Connecticut. I am seriously booked up until September. As you guys know, I'm not looking for business. I would repeat my request, and nobody called. I need another doctor to come help me, and I would like a young, energetic, smart, nice physician to come in who has an interest in trying to help people in a very real way. All right. Have you tried LinkedIn? I hear that works. Do doctors use LinkedIn? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, great to see you. It's, great to uh, see you. Thank Dr. you so much Stephen Phillips, me. everybody. We appreciate it. Thank okay. you so much. Right. Thank well, you, guys. I'm going to be covered up. I'm not going to the beach. I'm not going, to, I'm not going anywhere.